Uh, I'm John Seddon. I'm a software engineer at the Met Office. And for the last few years, I've been working on the Primavera project, which is an EU funded uh, project led by the Met Office. Okay, so Primavera, uh, it's a consortium of 20 different partners based all around Europe. And so the distributedness of us affected some decisions we made uh, and forced us to take certain options. In Primavera, this is what it stands for. But the important words are its processes involved in high resolution climate modeling. And so we're interested in the effect that resolution has uh, in climate models and we want to look at what it has in various processes. We want to make some future recommendations about what resolutions should be used in future. And so the challenge for us at the start of the project, we estimated that sort of two pet would produce two petabytes of model outputs, and in fact, we produce 1.6 petabytes of model outputs. This is from seven different uh, modeling centers based all around Europe. And the models are run on various HPCs around Europe. And then we've got, we've got over 100 scientists from these 20 institutes, all based around Europe, who want to analyze the data. And in the past, we might have put our data on ESGF and then people download it to home institutes, or people might even just have to put it on their FTP servers and other institutes would have to put it down. And for just this volume of data and this number of people, it's just not feasible to do that. So we had to come up with a more elegant solution. And so our solution is to take the analysis to the data similar to what Andrew was talking about, but in a slightly different way. So I'm sure you probably all know what Jasmine is. This is Jasmine seminar, but I'll quickly go over the components we're using. So Jasmine contains over 38 petabytes of this storage plus a tape archive too. There's 4,000 compute cores on the latest batch cluster, plus on the interactive data analysis servers. This is all linked together by high performance internal network, and very fast connections to the internet and to the European research networks. And Primavera was very privileged and it was able to have 404, 440 terabytes of group workspace disk storage allocated to it, to us. But as I said earlier, we generated 1.6 petabytes of data. So we had to work quite smartly because we couldn't hold all of our data on disk at once. <coughs> Sorry. So this is workflow that we developed. So we've got seven different climbing, climate modeling centers running climate models on HPCs around Europe. As soon as the runs have been completed on the HPCs, then the data is summarized, that is, it's converted to a standard NetCDF format with common metadata. It's then transferred to Jasmine and stored on group workspaces at Jasmine. As soon as the data has arrived on group workspace, we validate the data, so we check the metadata is actually correct, and then we store the metadata into the Primavera database. As soon as we finish validating the data, and then we copy the data, we move the data from group workspace into the elastic tape, the tape archive at Jasmine. So data can be deleted from group workspace to free up space for, for the next set of transfers to take place in. When users want to analyze the data, we've developed what we call the data management tool or DMT. I'll show you that in a second. The DMT, as far as the user's concerned, is a web interface that allows them to query the database to see what data is available. Uh, and then if data is, they can find out whereabouts it's stored on root workspace or they can request that it's restored from tape to disk. And users did the majority of work working in this way. Then towards the end of the project, we've copied the data from the tape and the group workspace into the CEDAR archive. And now it's permanently archived in, in the archive. And it's also available to the whole uh, climate modeling global community through the uh, System Grid Federation through CEDAR's ESGF node. So here I've got a screenshot from the web interface from the DMT. So here I'm looking at the RSUT variable, which is the top of the atmosphere outgoing shortwave radiation. I'm looking at the, in the AMON, which is the monthly table. I'm looking for the high-res future experiment, which is our coupled atmosphere emission future experiment. And I've sorted it by institute. And so you can see, if you have a look in the online status column, you can see the first four models all have a status of online. So that means the data is available on disk at the moment. And if users then click in the data files column, it will take them to the next page, which shows the actual paths to where the data is. Some of the later models are marked has a, have a status of partial, which means that some data is available on group workspace, but the rest of the data is only available on, on tape. And then some data has a status of offline, which means it's only available on tape. 
if users want to request data that's on tape, they click in the request retrieval column on the right hand side, then scroll down to the bottom and create their retrieval request. And actually, we uh, most of our data is stored in Cedar's Elastic Tape Archive, but MetaOffice data is actually held in the, in the MetaOffice Mass Tape Archive, which also has a direct connection to Jasmine. And so users are abstracted, abstracted from the complexity of the two different tape systems by the DMT, the data management tool. Then once the once users request data, the DMT starts to restore it from whatever tape and stores it in the, the in the Primavera DRS directory structure on the Primavera group workspaces. When the data is ready, the DMT sends the users an email to say their data is now available. When users have finished analyzing the data, they can click in on the views in the, in the top menu and go to the retrieval request uh, page. They can then mark their own retrievals as complete. Then once that's done, the DMT looks through, it sees if anyone else has requested that data. And if, if it has, if no one else has requested that data, then the DMT will delete it from group workspace to free up space for more users to restore their data to do their work. So this is the workflow that we encouraged users to use in the project. So first of all, they use the DMT to check the data is available. They can then retrieve a small subset of data and then work on the interactive data analysis uh, machines to develop their analysis software. When they're happy their software is working well, they can then use the DMT again to retrieve the full data set that they need. They can then run their analysis in parallel on the latest batch cluster. When they're happy with results, they can use the DMT to delete some mock data as complete so it can be deleted if no one else is using it to free up space for other users. So the whole project worked remarkably well. We had really good feedback. We did a survey of users at the end of the project, and we've had 100 users accessing this 1.6 petabytes of data. We've had over, over 70 uh, publications produced so far. One of the deliverables at the end of the project was a lessons learned document, and this is uh, you can obtain it from this link on this page. I'm just going to summarize the most important things that we learned, we feel we learned from this project. So collating and analysing data of a central facility such as Jasmine was really successful. We think it's the only sort of feasible method going forwards when working with this volume of data and this number of people. And similarly, for perhaps not every project can get access to Jasmine, but there are similar facilities at, uh, at DKRZ and CMCC. So, but we'd really encourage user projects in future to try and work on a facility such as Jasmine. When we're dealing with this much data, then all processes need to be as automated as possible. If anything requires human interaction, then it gets really slow and it creates a big workload for, you, for people. And so, yeah, to try and keep my life as easy as possible, then everything as much as possible is automated. And certainly to the end users, it was completely transparent. They would just uh, interact with the DMT and the data is made available when they need it. Then. We had some constraints on us because we were submitting data to CMIP6. So we had to comply with CMIP6 data request and the CMIP6 metadata standards. And so when we were starting a project when we were developing our data request, we had big problems because the CMIP6 data request was being developed and evolving at the same time. And the CMIP6 data request is quite different to CMIP5. It's much more complex than CMIP5 data request. So it's changing a lot. And these changes in the data request caused the modeling centers and the users a lot of effort to try and track and keep up with changes to the data request and so if you don't have a constraint that we had then i'd really then we, we'd really recommend that future projects try and pin down their data request and the metadata standards as soon as possible at the start of a project so people aren't chasing this moving goal when you're sort of planning the data request and your processes and your storage then it's, re it's really useful to have an estimate of the data volume. It's also really tricky. Uh, we overestimated, which is really good because we, we had less data to deal with than we imagined. We estimated two petabytes and we produced 1.6. Uh, so yeah, it was a good safe estimate, but this making such estimates is really tricky. And we've included some more information in the lessons learned document about how we did this, which might be useful for other people. It's important to keep the data request as small as possible. Uh, it's really expensive to produce this output from the models. It slows the models down. And also then it's tricky to store and to transfer the data. And so 
we had because we had 100 users we had quite a big broad community who all wanted different bits of data so our data request is quite large uh but yeah we'd encourage people to keep the data requests as small as possible and in fact at the end of the project we found that only 30 percent of the data that we produced by volume had actually been accessed so uh also we've made available in the lessons learned Liverpool uh, details of which variables at which frequency have access, been accessed so many times, how many times, because we have this information from the DMT. So this might be a useful resource for future projects when they're trying to work out which are the highest priority variables to include in their data request. And then in the project, we had very early involvement from Sita and Jasmine. So this made developing the project uh, very, it was an integral way of developing projects. So the whole project worked so well because we had the involvement uh, of CDEF from a proposal stage. So we'd recommend the future projects, you know, do design, you know, get help from CEDA as soon as possible. <clears throat> so just to summarize, this is some of the Jasmine services that we use in Primavera. So we had interactive site servers for developing analysis tools, but then as soon as they were complete, we encouraged our users to run their analysis on the like latest batch cluster. We use group workspaces, scratch storage, and then elastic tape, and a lot of our data was held in tape. The data transfer nodes were essential for transferring da the data from the HPCs into Jasmine. And we didn't put as much effort into optimizing our transfers as we expected we would, but we got sufficient rates. Most centers were managing to transfer 2.5, 2.5 terabytes a day. And our peak rate was actually from, uh, from Bologna, where we we're transferring 16 terabytes a day from Bologna into Jasmine. So data transfer works really well. And actually, it's really tricky to keep up for the latest to keep up with validation of the data when it's coming in at 16 terabytes a day. Uh, we made, made use of CEDAR archive at the end of the project. So the data, the output from the project is now archived for long-term reuse. And then also the data is made available from the archive in CEDAR's Earth System Grid Federation node to the global community. And then we used uh, virtual machines at Jasmine. So we ran the data man management tool and the database in managed cloud with the help of uh, CEDAR. And then also I've got an external uh, a VM in the external cloud uh, for development work. So thanks, if anyone's got any questions.